So thank you to the Academy for having us. This is an honor to be here. And uh, thank you to uh, the DPCA for the uh, Dragon's Milk last night. To Hint for bourbon after that. And for Bethany for putting us on at 8 o'clock. That was <laughs> a weird combination of things. But it's, it's really nice to be here. You want to talk about our disclosure? We have a... Uh, I don't know. Our slide's up. <laughs> Go back. Oh. Is that our first one? Perfect. Get back here. There we go. Yeah, so we don't have any conflicts of interest, but we do want you to know that um, this is a biased talk. So Vance and I are, um, are both big proponents of try, trying to get family doctors to actually practice like family doctors. So um, we, want, we want you to be pushed a little bit in this lecture, and so you should be expecting to maybe have your toes stepped on um, a little bit here, so. Or maybe a lot, but we still, we like you very much, no matter if you follow our, <laughs> you're still our friends, please don't throw stuff at us. So these are our um, learning objectives, so we want you to, um, at the end of this, be able to, um, be able to say some things that are opportunities for you to expand your scope of, uh, of care in direct primary care, both in the outpatient setting as well as the inpatient setting, uh, to be able to identify um, some ways that you can add value by expanding your scope, um, as well as some resources that might be around to give you some assistance in doing those things. So this is how you can interact with us, because we have horrible social skills. Yesterday. <laughs> We trolled, you may have seen Ryan laughing during the panel that Nick sat on, and we were trolling pretty hard on the, the questions. And I have asked Bethany not to delete all of the funny ones today. So in exchange for us stepping on your toes, you can make the funny, uh, very insulting questions. They should hopefully stay up, and I will address them at the end. Uh, all righty. So here, grab out your phones. You know the, you know the deal at this point in time. Um, we are now going to try to get a, a little bit of a sense of who you are. Um, so right now, do you practice DPC? Um, a, yes. B, no, and I'm not going to. You're at the wrong conference. P.S. If it's Sunday and you're here at this point, you probably missed that boat. Um, can't wait to start. Mad as hell, and I can't take it anymore, or what we like to call DPC curious. Um, or E, you're not even a doctor. You just like the food and hanging out with guys like us. Looks like we have some friends at the bottom. <laughs> I think we can also just Fri consider Friends those, in low places. Those, those are, those oh, those like are also votes for A, I think. Uh, right. Uh -huh. We can add that, so it's like 30, 50. Okay, so a lot of folks that are planning on starting a, a DPC practice, and this is the best point in time to be able to really kind of think about what your scope of care is going to be. And for those folks that are in the A group, we want to step on your toes and give you a little bit of a push. Before you click, don't click to that yet. Oh, no, just don't click again. Okay. We're going to introduce, thank you for letting us know who you are. We want you to know who we are. And we decided that we were going to introduce each other. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Thompson. So Dr., or I just call him Dr. Nick because I'm a Simpsons fan. So, <coughs> uh, so Dr. Thompson uh, opened his practice two years ago in, in Wichita, Kansas. He's, uh, as far as I know, your practice is already full. Pretty close. Am I turning on and off here? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Let me is it that thing? Yeah. Oh, do your collar. Yeah. All right. His wife stayed at home, so, so somebody's got to take care of him. It's not good if I travel without her. Um, he's been very successful. His practice is already full. And uh, I will tell you uh, that I, there's probably not a more complete doctor in direct primary care than Nick. Is this thing cutting out? It is, isn't it? It is a little bit. I can just talk. Uh, here we go. Thanks. They don't work on so, very, very, yeah, very Nick large is, uh, human beings. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nick is incredibly thorough, and, and uh, he does an amazing job for patients. I, I've been a big fan of Nick's ever since we first met, and uh, he really takes the oath he took seriously, and nothing comes between him, 
his patients and doing patient care right. And uh, he's an incredibly selfless individual. So now that I got that out of the way, um, let's talk a little bit about, I like to do this thing where, you know, we, we said, well, let's tell the audience something they don't know about their presenter. So, th so this is uh, Nick in his after hours. He likes, go ahead and hit the next slide. He, um, for one thing, he moonlights as a Lucha Libre wrestler. A lot of people don't know that. Um, also, he's very, very serious about efficiency, which is why he changed his last name because of the stupid phonetic spelling and the time-consuming silent letters. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so you can read these. I'm not going to read the slides to you. He's heavily tattooed, but you won't see any of that uh, today. <laughs> I'm not taking my shirt off. Unlike Jeff yes. Gold yesterday. <laughs> All right. That's... Yeah, there he is. There, night. There's an example. And this is, is Dr. Vance Lassie. Um, yeah, I just, I have a lot of respect for this guy. Um, he is in Holton, Kansas. He's been open a little bit more than two years. Um, an incredibly successful practice in a rural small town. Um, this guy does it all. Um, great, great dad, great father, um, great husband. Um, he, yeah, just has an amazing practice. And um, if you're looking for somebody to, to pattern your, your practice off of, it's this guy right here. So this guy right here. Uh, this guy. Um, we didn't really talk about our scope, which is what this talks about. Maybe we should tell what we do. That, that might be a good idea. Okay. So, so I do. In, there's a hospital in Holton that I'm, I work at. I also do the inpatient, my inpatient care there, and uh, outpatient. And I did OB up until uh, January of this year when our hospital, it's a small town, they actually the hospital shut down OB services. So I became forced retirement in, in OB. I still do all my prenatal care, but I can't. I don't have a place to deliver. And my insurance uh, company actually laughed at me when I asked him if I could do home delivery. So, um. <laughs> yep. And I do um, have a, a private practice, but also do inpatient care and um, still deliver babies. So we do variety of procedures as well. And I work part time um, a couple nights a month as a, a faculty for the local residency as well. So. All right. So we're going to move on, and we're going to talk a little bit. Oh, I forgot about this. this. Yeah is Dr. Lassie's things that you don't know. So I don't, I don't know if any of you know Scumbag Steve, but this is him. Dr. Vance likes to, uh, to pattern his life after them. Um, he hasn't always been Sasquatch-sized, but it does come in handy when he's applying Vanceonomics and putting the pressure on and negotiating for EKGs and spirometers. Um, he uh, has this thing that he likes to call a sensory processing disorder, so that's why this thing isn't working. So um, there's lots of good opportunities for uh, negotiating, including with Mountain Dew or other adult beverages. So, so let's get talking about how we can broaden your scope of practice. So pull out your phone again. Um, go ahead. So this one is uh, about your outpatient scope. So it's pretty straightforward. A, you're already a, an OPC, a DPC doc doing a lot of outpatient uh, extra stuff. Uh, B, you're open to the idea of broadening your scope. C, you're going to do a DPC and you want to have a wide spectrum of care. D, uh, you're interested in learning about maybe broadening your scope once you get into DPC. And E, I'm planning DPC, but I don't mind a watered-down practice, and I prefer f to the term physician the term provider. And I dare somebody to choose E. Yeah. Because I'm just going to make fun of you the we rest will, of the time. We will ask you to stand if <laughs> That's you've right. chosen letter That's right. E. Yeah. Dr. New, are you in the room? You can go ahead and stand go up. Go ahead and stand. <laughs> New awful. So okay. people want to learn how to broaden their scope. That's good. I guess that's why they came to this talk. Perfect. Awesome. How convenient. <laughs> All right. So we're going to move on to the next slide here, and I'm going to start this out with why. Why, why should you have a broader scope? So Nick and I understand, I mean, we don't understand, but we, we identify the forces that led to the demise of family doctors acting like family doctors. It's a bunch of broken system crap. That's why we're all here. Okay, but we changed the rules. That's the name of our talk. DPC changed the rules. So you no longer have to be that, that uh, mid-level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Um, it, there it is. It's stepping on your toes. The fact is, it's the right thing to do. Um, yeah. If you can bring superior value, uh, to your patients, you owe it to them. That's the oath you took. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention it adds value. You need, you need something 
to convince patients it's worth their money to come see you. So doing lots of procedures keeps them out of specialty offices and so on. Yep. So this is something that I think really adds a lot of value to our lives as well. So this is part of why my job is satisfying. Um, it can be a great way to either add revenue to your practice by um, charging individually for certain services or by just adding value to the membership that you already have. Um, and especially, you know, if, you, if you're doing, you know, just consultations and nothing else, it can be really hard to, to have that big bang for your buck moment when this patient comes to you and says, this is why I'm coming to see you and this is why I'm staying and this is why I'm telling all my friends. Um, and that can really occur with a lot of the, the broadening scope um, things that we do. So a good example of this as far as referrals or retention. So I have a mid 50s year old, year old patient that um, we were just coming back from vacation. Um, I pull into our driveway and I see this guy um, walking up uh, to my front door. Um, so he's a neighbor of ours. Um, I don't there's the boundaries uh, top topic was was yesterday, so we're just going to bypass that part. Um, so he's walking up to our front door without a shirt on, with a towel wrapped around his hand, covered in blood. And I unwrap the thing, and this is what it was. So this is with the patient's permission, by the way. Um, he had accidentally shot himself while cleaning his gun. That's another issue. Yeah, that's, we'll just leave it at that. But uh, the entrance wound, you can actually see the powder burn on the palm of his hand and the exit wound on the ultra, ulnar surface there. So I put him in my car. We drive to the ER. Um, he gets x-rays done there. Um, what do you know? The ER doctor never actually examines him. Um, they consult the hand surgeon. Hand surgeon says, yeah, washed out. Um, send him home. I'll see him the next day. They didn't bother putting him on antibiotics. They didn't bother uh, washing it or packing it or any of those kind of things. So I drive him back to my clinic and we wash it. I get him started on antibiotics, which were cheap. Um, and I uh, call the guy the next day and say, well, you know, how was the, the trip to the hand surgeon? Um, and he says, well, I called and they said, yeah, we can't fit you in today. We'll see you tomorrow, right? So this is experience that everyone has had. Um, so he goes the next day, the hand surgeon walks into the room after he's paid 125 bucks because he's uninsured. Um, the hand surgeon unwraps it, says, that thing's dirty, go wash your hands, come back and see me in a week. Oof, that about makes my blood boil. So this guy returns back to me on this day saying, hand surgeon didn't do anything, what do we do now? Okay, so the right answer for, for this patient is not specialty care, it's primary care, unfortunately. And this is a spot that you're going to be put in all day long, right? So if you don't choose to nut up a little bit and figure out how can you take care of this patient, which is going to be a little bit uncomfortable, um, you're going to not be able to care for this patient in the way that they needed. So with this guy, I consulted Rubicon, sent off a bunch of pictures, asked a bunch of questions, started doing my own research, and did all the wound care for this guy. So here you can see the, um, the closure. He would send me pictures every day. That's the back there. We have matching pop-up campers. It's pretty awesome. Um, you can tell we live in the high society around here. So um, uh, as the wound began to heal, we... Uh, ended up having a great outcome in him. Um, so you can see the, the change over time. Um, and this is where the bang for your buck comes. So this guy wears my t-shirt everywhere and he tells all of his friends and he's never going anywhere, right? So, so this is why you should broaden your spectrum. If I'm just taking care of his diabetes, he's not wearing my t-shirt, right? So this, this is where that bang for buck comes. And it's not just bang for your buck. I mean, it, it, I mean that's huge. Yep. But but this is the this right story, thing to do. This story, <clears throat> man, this story demonstrates what many of you already know, and that is that this system is failing our patients. And we took a note to protect those people. Yeah. And uh, they're just not going to do it right. And even when they should, even that's when they what they theoretically need. Yep. So it's going to fall on you to do it right. So so do it. So 
On the outpatient side, this is some ideas of how you can add to your outpatient scope. Everything on the screen, I'm not going to read it to you, is stuff that Nick and I do. And there's obviously, there's obviously a lot more. This is just kind of off the top of our head. Um, you know, on this, as far as uh, big bang for your buck stuff that people love, minor surgery in my office, I do a lot of that kind of stuff, skin stuff. Uh, I do vasectomies. I think I'm the only DPC doctor besides Nick in Kansas who does vasectomy. And I don't, want the, I don't want my Kansas City contingent back here to learn vasectomy because they send them all to me and I make a lot of money on them. So other than the Kansas City people, that's a procedure you should all probably learn. Um, <laughs> and when I say I make a lot of money, I make a little bit of money on them. But the thing is, I, I do it for less than half of what the urologists charge. You know? So they're like the lowest ones, 800 bucks, mm -hmm. and I charge four. You know? So um, pretty straightforward. Um, anything on here we need to talk about? I guess not. Yeah, and well, so with a lot of these things, you may not be um, prepared or, or able to manage a gunshot wound. I wasn't necessarily prepared to manage it either. But we're going to give you a few examples of things that, that you may be able to do and take one step towards that direction. So some of these things, you may not be the most procedurally oriented person, but you can broaden your scope in a lot of other ways. So you've got expertise in... Um, in a variety of different things. Your patients are always wanting to talk with you, do some counseling-based services, um, talk about uh, dietary changes. Um, and the other piece that we are so good at is interpreting the specialist ease into actual English, or if your patients are Spanish-speaking Spanish or another language. So. so the first step of this is you just have to do it, okay? So you have something that comes into your office, patient needs something, you figure it out. What happens if, you, if that's not the case? So I didn't do vasectomies in residency, but I wanted to start doing them. Um, and so I ended up finding an old town family doc that was uh, getting closer to retirement. Um, he had moved to Wichita, uh, or he was living in Wichita, so I um, have him come to my practice and he precepts me when I do vasectomies. And I pay him back in rum, which works well for both of us. So um, the, that's the way that I'm going about learning a procedure that I didn't get trained in. On the, on the just do it thing, doing things when you're a little bit uncomfortable with them, I had a patient just, just late last night, I got the text at like 2 a.m. I mean, I think he probably texted me before that, but I got it at 2 a.m. And he's a smoker and he has this little growth on the bottom of his tongue and he's convinced he has cancer. And maybe he does, I don't know. But he asked his dentist and his dentist says, ah, let's just watch it, you know. And so he goes, yeah, I don't know if I'm comfortable watching this thing because I smoke and this thing could be cancer. You know, can you biopsy this? Have I ever biopsied a white nodule lesion off the bottom of someone's tongue? No. What did I tell him? Yeah, sure. You know, I don't know how to do it yet, but I will by the time I do it. Okay. All right. So Rubicon, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, and uh, YouTube and, and Vimeo videos. So that's another thing. I mean, in residency, that's how you learn procedures, right? You watch one first, right? Watch one, do one, teach one, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Watch one on the internet, you know? You can learn a lot of stuff that way. Um, and we're coming back to Rubicon, right? And we're not, we're not getting paid by anybody, any company, and there's other companies besides Rubicon, I'm sure, that make specialists available to you, but that's one that we'll probably talk about. I think we have another mm -hmm. video coming up here in a little bit, but. Yep. Yeah, here we go, YouTube. Yep, so um, this is another good example of a procedure that I didn't know how to do, and I'd mentioned this a little bit yesterday. I've got a guy with bilateral Dupuytren's contractures. Um, he had come in uninsured, says, I, I can't do my job anymore. I can't hold a cup. I can't put my finger in my pocket, because, or my hand in my pocket, because my finger's stuck at 60 degrees on one side and 40 degrees at the other side. Um, so I went back and did a bunch of research, looked up some papers, and our fav one of our favorite ways to learn is by watching YouTube videos or Vimeo videos or um, looking for resources of people doing it that we can watch. So I, this is on, the, on your left, um, this is a video with 32,000 views of a guy doing a needle aponeurotomy to r release a Dupuytren's contracture. And the video on the right is me with no views because it's still private, but um, doing a Dupuytren's contracture release um, with a needle aponeurotomy. So this is a procedure I didn't know how to do, 
um, beforehand, did a bunch of research, asked Rubicon, watched a bunch of videos, um, did informed consent with the patient. I'm not a hand surgeon, but um, I, once again, was the most appropriate person to do this procedure for him, and he's now at zero degrees, both hands. He can do his job. So, and that was 20 bucks in our clinic. So, What's it cost if he uh, doesn't get it through you? Yeah, it, uh, probably about five to six grand at the hand surgeon. So that's, that's pretty good, pretty good savings for the patient. So um, are we able to play the... Yeah, go to the next line. Oh. Go, it's on the next line. Oh, uh, wasn't it? Maybe. Uh, I don't... I guess not. Can we play that video? Do you know what I'm talking about? It was on uh, one of the slides. On the, the Rubicon link. I back think if one. you just click, you know, go back one more. That Rubicon thing is a link, I think. Yep. Yeah, so this started out as, it was an advertisement Rubicon did featuring me because oh, of this case. That's a good case. looking dude right there. Yeah, right. This case I did, it, it demonstrates what we're talking about today. Uh, even though it's an advertisement, they're not paying us, okay? There's probably other people that do what they do just, well, just fine. You might have to narrate. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just, uh, and I use Rubicon MD specialty e-consults. Diane came to us. She had a large basal cell carcinoma, huge cancer on the side of her nose. I was not financially secure enough to go to like a dermatologist and have it removed. People never saw me. They only saw it. I came in and saw Dr. Lassie. He discussed with me what it was. It's the kind of thing I take off all the time, but in this area, on the nose and being that big, it's just beyond the scope of my traditional practice with that kind of lesion. With Rubicon MD, I was able to quickly put a console in. Um, within 12 hours, I was uh, corresponding back and forth with a specialty, in this case, what they call a Mohs uh, surgeon, a dermatologist that's trained in a special uh, type of plastic surgery. Uh, they kind of walked me through what I needed to do. I don't think I would have done the procedure I did on Diane if I didn't have Rubicon MD because I just don't know that this is a procedure I would have been comfortable with without the specialist who really specializes in this area coaching me through it. It went great you know, because of that. So she had a great outcome and saved thousands, I mean thousands of dollars. Very few people notice that I had the surgery done because it was done well enough that it, it's not noticeable. Dr. Lassie gave me my face back. So, no, don't. So, no, come on, come on. She, that, that, that basal cell on her nose, it was about the size of a stack of nickels. I mean, it was big. And I'm just like, That's the way we describe things in Kansas. It's technical, right? Stack of nickels. <laughs> it was. <laughs> All right. So, the, this, if you didn't tear up a little bit about that. like No, the music makes you do oh, that. Man. We control people's emotions Gosh. with the piano music. Yeah, so that changed this gal's life. And you maybe don't need to remove basal cells from people's nose, but taking those steps towards doing something that you're a little bit uncomfortable to give your patients great care, that's what we're really pushing you for. No. So how do you practically add, add stuff like this? So these are some resources that we use. I got, I got to say about that lady, she had just lost her job, and she'd been saving up to have Mohs surgery, and she had to use the money she'd saved up to live since she'd lost her job, and then she couldn't get another job because she had this big, bloody thing on the side of her nose. And so, you know, who's going to hire you to be a bank teller, when this, you know, or whatever. So, so she was broke and that man, it really helped her a lot, helped her a lot. Okay. So some of the resources, the first one, we, is, is these, there's books, right? And I know that most books are, you know, these days are out of date the minute they come off the printing press. That's why we use the interwebs, but there are actually a few that you need. And the one on the left is Finnegar's. Um, you really need that book. Um, mm -hmm. the one on the right is fracture management. That's the IFN hatch book. Um, I, I used that book so much I wore it out and it fell, it, it fell apart. Like literally the last 20 pages just disappeared and I had to buy a new copy of the new, of the new edition. Um, and then we use a lot of social networking. I mean, use us, call us up, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll tell you, oh yeah, I did that. Here's how I learned. There's this video right here, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, this community is powerful and you can learn a lot from each other. So really rely on each, mm -hmm. on each other with, uh, with social networking and making, yeah. uh, making uh, contacts. And these are things where, if you haven't noticed, we're kind of a likable group. We, we tend to not berate folks for asking questions and not uh, say, hey, that's a silly thing to ask. Like, if you have a patient with something that you're wanting to try to do, 
post it up on Facebook or put it on Slack with the DPCA and um, ask a question. And somebody probably has done it or at least has an idea of where you can get started. Um, so you, let's say you are in the, I'm going to be opening my clinic, but haven't yet, and I have no money, and here are some ways that you can add value and add um, kind of expanding your scope from an, an easy perspective. So first place to start, um, cryotherapy, right? So everybody in the employed world, it just like magically showed up in your room, liquid nitrogen, right? And you had the fancy gun. Um, the fancy gun's like 600 bucks. The thing to store the liquid nitrogen in is like three to 600 bucks. And you gotta refill this thing. So these are all pieces that become difficult when you're trying to keep your overhead low. Um, so DPC docs do it better, um, or at least just as well. So we use something called Medical Freeze. You buy it 26 bucks on Amazon. Um, if you cut a Q-tip off that has a plastic shank on it, you can stick the thing right in the end of the sprayer, and then when you spray, the Q-tip turns frozen, and you can freeze off AKs or warts or those kind of things, or you can use the ear speculums, um, cut them off at different sizes, put it right over the top of an AK, squirt the stuff in the hole, let it freeze, what do you know? It's gone in, in a couple days. So they also make cryo cones um, that you can spray this stuff into. Um, you can then do a bunch of derm for warts and AKs and uh, anything you would do cryotherapy for. And continuing on the dermatology, uh, shave biopsies and other kinds of biopsies, you can do dirt cheap. So this kind of shows you a $4. And I did actually looked at all these prices on these different kinds of things that you see here. And if you add it up, I even priced a couple pieces of gauze just because I'm not going to be, this, this is going to be perfect, accurate. For $4.18, you can do shave biopsy. And a lot of that 418 is for the forceps, which you will reuse. So there's no reason not to do it. It's super duper easy to, to learn how to yeah. do shaves for anybody yeah. who's not doing shaves. And those are just a, a flexible safety razor that you can put in a, a sterilizer pack and throw in your autoclave. Yeah, people buy derm, they're called derm blades or derma blade or something, and they're several dollars per blade. You can buy a whole box of those for like five bucks and throw them in your autoclave. And another lecture, uh, I, there's no Vansonomics lecture this year, but uh, I would tell you how to get the uh, autoclave for free. Um, so it doesn't even come into the price. Yeah. But anyway. We bought our autoclave from a, a washed up tattoo artist. So 200 bucks on Craigslist works great. Um, as far as another option that you can do, so we, uh, this is, I don't know if this is a product that any of you have heard of, it's Mepo Deadrol, because um, we're, we don't want to promote any products around here. Um, so we, joint injections are an easy thing to do. Um, there's good options for learning these things by watching YouTube videos or the uh, Finninger and Fowler book has a bunch of options there as well. Um, uh, Individual vials of this stuff are about uh, 15 to 17 bucks, and multi-use uh, vials from several different resellers are um, about seven to 10 bucks per injection. So great benefit to your patients. They don't need to go to ortho. They don't need to go to ortho. They don't need to go to ortho. <laughs> <laughs> this is an incision, uh, it's incision and drainage kit. Again, most of that $4 is gonna be in your hemostat, which you're gonna reuse. The little red rubber band thing is a silicone vessel loop. Raise your hand, and I'm serious, no judgment. Raise your hand if you don't know what a silicone vessel loop is for incision and drainage. Okay, that's what I thought. So, uh, man, I'm going to, I'm just, there's you're too good. many, too many hands came up for me not to talk yeah, about this. Don't incise and pack, drink, just don't do that. No packing is necessary. There's so, is so much better way of doing it with vessel loops. Plus, it's cheaper. Your patient has to come in for packing. It doesn't hurt as much less infection, faster healing. It's called loop, it's just called vessel loop drainage, I think. There's a wonderful video uh, after a paper was, uh, there, the, a paper was written uh, on this in the Journal of Pediatrics, like 2007, and, the, and uh, this guy uh, presents this really good video on, it's on Vimeo. So write, write, <clears throat> man. write this down, Vimeo uh, is like YouTube if you're not familiar with Vimeo, and go to Vimeo and search for vessel loop drainage and watch that video, and it will transform how you do INDs. And I mean, uh, man, I would love to talk about that. I'm passionate yeah. about it. Anyway, but you can do that super cheap, 
And uh, also those um, silicone vessel loops come in two packs and most of the time you only need one, which means you get to throw the other one back in the autoclave and now you're, they're going twice as far for you. Yep. Um, okay, we'll talk more about that if we have time later. Yep, and we're, we are glad to talk after this is over as well if you have specific questions. Um, so you're not into pus and, um, and blood and doing uh, crazy surgical procedures. Um, what are some other ways that you can expand your scope? So there's a lot of us that um, didn't get trained in sleep medicine, but we have all sorts of patients that have sleep apnea. So you learn how to do it. Um, with both of our practices, we have um, cash prices for in-home sleep studies, also overnight oximetry. So with our office, uh, sleep study is about 175 to 200 bucks. Um, overnight oximetry is 20 bucks. Um, for patients that you got the guy that comes in, they've got like a 36-inch neck, right? So it's the same size as their waist. Think Jeff uh, Gold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brutal. Um, Sorry. So you, you, you just, you know they have sleep apnea. They're, they fall asleep while they're driving. They, um, they snore all night and their wife is telling them to sleep on the couch. Um, do an overnight oximetry. If they're hypoxic, they probably got sleep apnea. Um, just empirically treat them, right? If they do better, you're not going to harm them by putting some pressurized air on, repeat the, the overnight oximetry, um, and make sure they're not hypoxic on a CPAP. So we're able to do this. You can get uh, the kind of Cadillac version through an online retailer that we use um, of an auto PAP. So it automatically senses the pressures and adjusts those accordingly um, for about 650 bucks, including all of the accessories, um, the, their choice of mask, and tubing, all the whole, whole shebang. Um, or if you like to vansonomics it in Wichita, you can come and visit us. We got a place that's called the Medical Loan Closet, um, and we buy used um, auto paps for 20 bucks for our patients um, and uh, get them essentially all the way treated for usually less than 100 bucks total. Um, so this is a way that you can add a lot of value to your patients. And for those of you who are like I used to be whenever I was inside the system and I'm like, oh man, dude, you got sleep apnea probably, but I've got 400 people in the waiting room and you know, whatever, I can't, you know, I don't really know, but tell you what, here's a referral piece out. And they go, to, by the time that individual is identified, titrated and treated for sleep apnea, they are paying $6,000 or more. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that you know, until they came back and told me and complained about it, which is one of those kinds of things that pushed you here. I mean, we can do for in 200 bucks what's costing people 6,000 in some cases. Okay, okay, inpatient care, this is me. We got another, oh yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is you. Plot another phone. question. So, I'm DPC and already do inpatient care. I'm DPC and don't do inpatient, but I would like to. DPC and do inpatient care, or, or want to do inpatient care, but I have some obstacles. Um, not DPC, but will do inpatient care if I can figure out a way, and not DPC, and I don't want to do inpatient care after I start. Oh, you're killing us. Killing us. <laughs> I'm going to try to convince the 28% of you that don't want to that you should want to. We're going to do this opinion survey. You don't need to click in on this one. Just raise your hands. You believe, A, DPC docs can do inpatient better than hospitalists because of time availability and increased continuity. Okay, very good. You think hospitalists can do better than DPC docs inpatient because they do it all day long for a living, which I believe somehow compensates for crappy continuity. It's almost like they think the question's biased and they all voted for A. So we're, we are clearly biased. So we do inpatient care. We think that this is a huge value add to your patients. But once again, this is the right thing to do. You know the patient. The hospitalists don't know the patients. Like they don't know them. They don't know their history. They don't have um, years or or lots of time with this patient where they've seen them in the outpatient setting and know the progression of the disease that they have that required them to be hospitalized. Um, also, if you haven't noticed, hospitals are terrible places to have coordination of care performed. Did you ever, has the hospitalist ever called you up to ask you a question about a patient? No. In your career? No. 
right? Is this, is this true? Yeah. Um, addition, in addition, hospitalists aren't the only ones with up-to-date, right? So you have up-to-date just like they do. And even if you haven't been in the hospital for forever, um, you got up-to-date. Read up on, on a condition. And if you've got somebody in the hospital and you need a specialist, hey, they're con you can consult them. Um, and if you're already in the hospital doing social work rounds, why not just manage the patient? So this is, is something that is pretty easily done. And the patients are going to be texting you anyway, asking you all their questions. You're going to be coordinating all their care. You're going to be keeping the hospitalist in line. So why not just see them yourself? That'll stay on the slide. So sure. anybody here not ever had the experience where after your patient gets out of the hospital, they come back to you and you... They have no idea why they were there, what was done. You have no follow-up paperwork. You didn't talk to the doc, right? Okay, even worse. And this one has made me damn near homicidal. Have you guys <laughs> ever been on that phone call with the hospitalist because you are holding your uh, hospitalist feet to the fire? And like, so all the hospitalists, so I, have, I do my inpatient care in Holton, but sometimes I'll have somebody that needs something that's in a bigger city, like they need a heart cath or whatever. And so I'm having to deal with the hospitalist remotely, and I talk to them every day, and and they are terrified of me. Like, I am the attending, and they are the first-year resident in, in Topeka, where most is a hospital. Because if they are checking out a, trans, a patient who's transitioning back to me, I'm going to pimp the crap out of them. Because the first time this ever happened to me, you know, this hospital, this poor person, I mean, he probably had 30 patients, and he'd probably been on the shift for four hours. He doesn't know who's who, what's what. And I've already read all their labs and everything because I got it on the EMR or whatever, or on their portal or something. And I'm mean, like, what, you know, what about that hemoglobin of 6.2? Are you sending them home with that? What about that creatinine of 2.9, whatever? And they're like, uh, <laughs> And I mean, I just ripped, oh my God. And so now, whenever a hospitalist calls me, I'm telling you, you, you can tell. They're like, oh yes, and uh, their creatinine was 1.9. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're ready, you know? So my point is, if you've had that, you go, these, these people are caring for my patient? Mm -hmm. These people don't know, they don't know. I mean, okay, you got it, yeah. right? I'm passionate so about this. You're, right. you're doing DPC because you love your patients, right? You care about them deeply and you want them to be well cared for. That's why you're doing this. This is a way to really care well for your people. I tell those hospitals, I'm like, if this was your mom, I bet you would know her creatinine. And you ought to treat my patient just as good as her. Yep. Pisses me off. Yep. So we understand that there are, there are definite barriers to getting back into the hospital. So many of you have left the hospital because you were burned out of it and it wasn't something you wanted to do. So um, getting, getting privileges again can be difficult. It's usually, if you're, especially if you're just coming out of residency, get your privileges then and maintain your privileges. Um, if it's something where um, you may need to be board certified in order to get privileges at certain hospitals, um, you can be board certified with several different, um, different uh, organizations. Sometimes there's turf battles or administrators that don't get Medicare-related uh, things. I'll let you kind of... Well, the, the thing about administrators is that they don't understand all this stuff, and so they just, uh, they just say you can't do it. And so what this is, and many of you have heard me talk about this before, but this is the, uh, the Walmart employee. Whenever you call Walmart or you know, whatever store, and you're like, hey, do you guys have whatever in stock? Uh, no. <laughs> they, 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 they don't know. They just went through this mind. This is what happened in that, you know, like that high school dropout's brain whenever you ask that question. Okay, they want to know if we have, uh, you know, whatever, size large socks that are, have red stripes. Or, you know, I don't know why you would want that. But anyway, I'm going to have to walk all the way over there to the sock department and then look. And then I, I, I get paid $8 an hour and it doesn't, I get paid the same whether I do this or not. No, we don't have that, right? That is exactly what a hospital administrator does whenever you try to say, I need to be having privileges at your hospital and I'm opted out of Medicare. Uh, 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 you can't do that. Yes, you can. They just don't know. They've never had anybody ask them and they're too lazy to do the work. C keep in mind, you're going to make money for their hospital. They should be like, well, let me figure this out. Yep. No, they just go, uh, no, no, that's different and scary. Okay. Yeah. This also may require you to have different malpractice 
Um, so you, it, your malpractice may be slightly more expensive. Um, my malpractice is about twice as expensive, but still very affordable, but that's with OB inpatient overseeing residents. So. Um, so how do you get your foot in the door? So the first thing is you just have to go for it. You gotta push a little bit. Um, apply for privileges, see if you get them. If you need to be precepted a little bit, that make it happen. Um, you can also moonlight at smaller hospitals potentially, um, cover ER shifts to kind of get your foot back in the, in the hospital side. Um, there are um, different groups, especially if you have multiple practices in your location. Um, start a call pool and um, see each other's patients in the hospital. Um, you can also, so this is one of the ways that I, I do this, is I um, teach for a local residency. Um, so I get to train young doctors and uh, tell them about direct primary care and why this is beneficial or um, do you know how much that medicine is and, and do you know what we can do in the office with this person. Um, but I also then get to do inpatient care and help to train residents from that that standpoint. If you've got a hospital that's trying to make it hard for you to get privileges for whatever reason, I know there's like university hospitals where you pretty much have to be on, you know, full-time staff. There's going to be b pretty rough barriers like that. But in general, at a hospital where private physicians can, should be able to have privileges, if they're making life hard for you, they hate negative press. Just, just threaten them with it. Say, listen, I would love to go to the newspaper and tell them, if I understand this right, that you're saying a doctor in this town cannot take care of his or her patients in your hospital. Is, I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. So when I'm talking to the editor of the editorial page, I, I, I get the quote right. Is that, is that right? Uh, uh, well, we can maybe figure something out. Come on. Yep. So let me take care of my patients, especially if, you've, if you can present, put, it down, put together a packet with the last 10 malpractices that their hospitalists did to your patients, which will be the last 10 admissions, by the way. <laughs> okay? And say, you know, here's what they did wrong. I don't do crap like that. I think it's probably better if I take care of them, and then how they argue with that. Yep. You've, got a, you've got the upper, upper ground on that. Or I call think. one of us, and we'll help you argue. That's right. Um. Some, stick me on them. <laughs> um, so this last one we're not going to spend a ton of time on, but this is something that we think is, um, is really important. So you were trained as a family doctor, right? So let's, let's pop over to doing OB in a DPC practice. So uh, it's, it's a big value. I mean, healthy families, they love it. It's nice to, and you get to deliver the baby. So you take care of them the whole time. And that's something new inside the system now. Most women don't get their obstetrician as their delivering physician. Um, so that's a nice thing. Um, I mean, it's, you can read the slide. It's exhilarating. It gives you a couple of gray hairs sometimes. I get that. But if you, if you still have uh, the chops and you've done it recently enough, it's, it's worth it. But I know this isn't something that's for everybody. There's, there's even... You know, sadly, a lot of uh, residencies that aren't even teaching OB anymore in family medicine. But your family doctor and families have babies. So that's the way we look at it. Also, if you, as you see here, you can go to the next slide. Babies on Facebook are the best marketing that there is. And so this is also, this, this is why I'm wearing a blazer, by the way. People who know me know that the last time I wore this was either at a funeral or a wedding. But the reason I wore it was because I had to outdo Nick because he always outdoes me in everything. So, like, here's the, the picture of the first baby I delivered. And I'm like, look, I had a baby in direct primary care, yay. And then like six months later, his first delivery in direct primary care was twins vaginally. <laughs> I can't beat this guy. Yeah. If you, if you haven't ever tried it on your Facebook page, just put a picture of a random baby on your, on your business's Facebook page and watch the likes. It's like hundreds. So this best way to market your practice. So um, this is definitely challenging, but if you are wanting to do OB and want, or wanting to continue doing OB as you transition to direct primary care, um, it's doable. And we both, we both are either doing it or have done it. Um, there's definite malpractice issues, and this can be very state-specific as far as cost. Um, it's something where you have to maintain your skills, and you have to have enough numbers of deliveries to be able to um, be current and give people good care. Okay, with, um, with all this, um, 
some of the ways that we've been successful in doing OB um, largely has been finding kind of niche communities that um, are looking for a DPC style doctor. So um, we have quite a few patients in our practice that we deliver that are um, with cost sharing ministries or um, come from uh, certain um, groups of patients that want that kind of almost a doctor and a doula combined. So that's a lot of the relationship building that we, we have with our, our patients. Also, this is a huge benefit for patients that are uninsured, make too much for Medicaid, but don't have a private insurance plan. We can deliver them for way less expensive than what they could through a, a private practice. But you are probably not, this is one area in DPC where you're, the, the financial cell is not going to end up bringing in patients. It probably will be more expensive for you to deliver them than for um, them to use their Medicaid or use their insurance with a $3,000 deductible. Um, so you got to sell something else. So sell your availability, sell your, um, uh, y you're going to be the doctor that will deliver them and not somebody in a 50 person call group that they've never met before. Um, and then find ways to make it inexp as inexpensive as you can. So send their ultrasound out to somewhere and bill it uh, through their insurance. That way, um, if they're going to be meeting their deductible, you help them not have that extra out-of-pocket expense. So we want to leave. we got about 10 minutes. We'd like to leave some room for, for questions. I want to see what you, how much you guys have trolled us. Is it pretty good? Oh, it's real good. Awesome. All right. There's good ones in. All right. All right, guys. Um, how, uh, how about setting up a, this guy's, this has 25 votes. Oh, yeah. How about setting up a DPC MacGyver channel with cool videos of procedures? I'm down with that. Oh, yeah. I'm a huge MacGyver fan. And speaking of MacGyver, uh, you guys may know this guy used to have his awesome mullet, kind of like MacGyver, <laughs> but he shaved it off. And so uh, you're much less attractive without the mullet, I must say. Yeah. How long, um, my wife, how, my how, wife disagrees. How long has this bromance been blossoming? <laughs> at, least, at least since DPC Summit 2015. Uh -huh. That's when I first started to question my sexuality about Nick. Um, about three years, and it's just, it just gets harder every year. No pun intended. Um, how about Next. you? <laughs> How do you just, okay, this is a good question. How do you decide what procedure to charge for um, and is it included or, or versus included in membership fee? So what I do is the only procedure I charge more than my, my, my uh, membership fee is, is vasectomy just because that one, it's basically because I can because no one else is doing it in anywhere. So, and I charge, I think I charge for vasectomy. I think I charge my own patients like 250 or 300. And if you're a patient of another direct primary care, I charge 400, and I'll do vasectomies for non-members for 500, just because $500. But I don't charge for anything else. I don't charge for anything else I do. Everything in my practice, other than vasectomy, is included with your membership fee. Yeah. I don't think your model's exactly the same as yeah, mine. Yeah, and this is the beauty of it. You set it up how it works for you and for your patients. So in our, in our practice, um, what we tell folks is if it costs less than 10 bucks, we throw it in, our, in with your membership. If it's more than 10, um, we um, end up charging the cost of the, the supplies. So um, that's the way that we end up doing it. And then for certain specialty procedures, um, we um, always talk about the price up front with our patients before we do it. And then we say, is this something you want to do here? Can we refer you out? Okay, so could you recommend resources, training programs, courses? Uh, for broadening your education and scope if it's been years since doing some of the stuff that, that we're talking about. Uh, well, the stuff we listed is kind of how we do it. We use, we use books, internet, uh, we talk to people. We use uh, specialists that we talk to online with Rubicon or specialists we know or whatever. But yes, there are courses where you can go learn procedures. There are procedure courses where all you do at the whole you know, weekend conference like this is hands-on, especially derm. And you know what? Out of all the procedures you do in your office, probably like 80% of it's going to be, well, if you don't count joint injections, I guess, mm -hmm. like 80% of it's going to be derm. So yeah, go to, take a derm, go to a derm conference uh, co yeah. course uh, for derm procedures. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I did yep. that once. And there's, actually. you know, even like go and get trained in dermoscopy. This is something that I have on my radar. Um, there's 
one of the courses that I'm planning on going to here in the next year or so is, um, especially point of care ultrasound is something that I'm big into and help teach at the residency some, um, and something I'm really interested in, but want more training in. So um, if there's something you need to do, Google it, find a course, go, yep, or come and visit one of us. So. Say you have a surgical complication. In court, will it hold up when you say, I learned it on YouTube? Is this the standard of care? We are being held to a higher standard by attorneys. I don't care what the attorneys say. I practice the best possible standard of care I can. I do not do defensive medicine ever. Mm -hmm. And I've also never been sued because my patients know that I really care about them and want what's best. And, I, and, and like we said, like on, the, like on the, uh, the, big, the big basal cell that you saw there, I mean, there was, no, there was nothing hidden. I'm like, I have never done this procedure before. I've watched it on TV. I've talked to experts. And that's the way You've it is. And, and, and I, and I've done a lot of other dermatology related procedures. Yeah, before. I mean, I've done so these a lot, just not this was big and on the nose and whatever. And she's like, I get that. I understand. I know. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Your nose could fall off and you could die. <laughs> and she's like, okay, just tell me where to sign. <laughs> so, I mean, I, the, the defensive medicine drives up the cost of care and it drives down the quality because it pushes, you know, you, you into the hand surgeon that leaves a gaping freaking gunshot wound hole open for four days. I mean, you, you've, you've got to do what's best for your patients and don't be scared of the, you know, the attorneys and stuff. That's my opinion, but yeah. you have a take on that? Yeah, you know, I think we, you need to become an expert in doing informed consent with your patients. So um, another patient walked into my practice um, just last week and says, hey, I got this weird thing on my hand. Um, I think, I don't know what this is. I've been Googling it. I think it's a Dupuytren's contracture. I said, hey, I just released one of those the other day. Um, I said, here's your options. I can do this in my clinic. I'm not a hand surgeon. I'm not an expert. I can send you to the specialist. He wanted to go to the specialist. I didn't make him get the procedure done in my office. So, you know, this is something where doing true informed consent is something that you do every day in your DPC clinic. So, do you want to treat your diabetes? Here's why you should. Here's the risks of not doing it. But I'm not going to make you treat your diabetes if you don't want to. So that's a, a choice that you can make. And that puts you, you know, there's, there's legal liabilities in that as well. How do you continue uh, to do hospital? Oh, sorry, you done? No. Dr. Oh. Paul's stepping up to the Oh, mic. man. Yeah, this isn't as hard to ask in a short form question, but I just want to put it out there. So I'm in Detroit, a relatively mar large market, and um, there are four major hospital systems that wouldn't really look too kindly on a small family doc coming in and taking care of patients inpatient. Mm -hmm. So I tell them to get bent. Okay. <laughs> Do you? I mean, other than that, <laughs> take, take the editor of the newspaper out to dinner, buy him a bottle of bourbon, make a good relationship, then go back and talk to the CEO again. Right. Uh. I mean, I guess. What I'm struggling with is... Aaron Brockovich, it, man. Come on. I, I, know, I know a lot of folks have, like, for example, if they have HAP, then they can only go to this hospital, or if they have this insurance, they can only go to this hospital. I guess I'm just struggling, and maybe other mm -hmm. people are in the room as well, with do I get um, privileges at multiple hospitals? At all four hospitals. Or, yeah. yeah, and will I be stretching myself too thin? That's yeah. why I've kind of been well, like, well, I'd really mm -hmm. like to, because I know they do the crappy job, because mm -hmm. there's no continuity, but is it really worth my time to be um, privileged at all four hospitals? Well, put those two things you just said together. I know they really do a qu crappy job. Then you say, is it worth my time? So what you just said, is it worth my time to not let them do a crappy job taking care of my patients? Like you have a, you know, I think that you owe it to them to at least try, right? Now, do you have to go to all 17 hospitals in the metro area and all that? No, I mean, I think, you know, if it's me, like I'm lucky. It's a small town, there's only one option and whatever. Um, so, you know, I think... In, yeah, in Wichita, I'm privileged at one of the two major hospital systems. Yeah, so yeah. if patients go to the other hospital system, um, they know I'm not going to see them. So, yeah, that's, that's my answer to that question. And I think some is better than none. You've got to start somewhere, pick the hospital that most of your patients would be going to, and at least get visiting privileges. So then you can be in there, help maintain that continuity, um, rein in the hospitalist, um, and then work your way in. Find somebody else in the area that's also doing it, share a call with them, um, you know, get your foot in the door, and then make steps towards, uh, towards the goal that you have.
if you're there all the time and doing all this, you know, holding their feet to the fire like I do, you're going to be such a pain in their butt that the hospitals are going to like ask the hospital to give you privileges. Like, please, just let this guy do the work because he's making our life miserable, right? I mean, um, this other question pertains to that, but we've got a, a question here first, I guess. A legitimate question. A legitimate. No, these are pretty, well, I haven't, I haven't even gotten to the troll questions hardly yet. So uh, I just opened two and a half months ago. I'm Congratulations, gonna... clap. I am in a small town, a uh, town of 8,000. I have OB privileges. I have inpatient privileges. Um, I am struggling with, when I do inpatient, I've put on my website that I'm charging per day I see them mm -hmm. in terms of people being like, well, I'm gonna rack up a $10,000 bill. Why would I wanna pay extra for you to take care of me in the hospital? Why do you charge extra? Why not just include it with your membership fee? I was curious if you guys, I don't know, I mm -hmm. DPC Facebook group, like they told me to do it. Yeah. No, um, <laughs> I was curious, do you guys charge extra for your inpatient? Well, first, first of all, you, you guys, it's not like we're gonna say, oh well, because uh, I gotta do what those guys told me, I gotta start doing inpatient. I gotta get up at 5 a.m. every day and do rounds. No, we get to do wellness care and direct primary care. I mean, really, how many patients are you admitting? I mean, nine out of 10 times, you're gonna be able to keep them out of the hospital to begin with. You're not gonna be rounding that often. So um, there's not like, it's not like it's gonna be a huge revenue stream to tack that on, but you can if you want. I don't, I just tell patients, hey look, you pay me a monthly fee the way I see it, you've already paid me to take care of you in the hospital. But I don't have to go to the hospital that often because you have gastroenteritis and you're dehydrated, come into the office, I'll give you IV fluids. You don't even need to go, you see what I mean? You're not being admitted. What do you do? You charge like 20 bucks or something? Yeah, I, we're not supposed to talk about pricing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Whoops. Um, right. But uh, yeah, so our price is on our website if you want to find it. But um, we charge a minimal fee, and oftentimes we waive it for folks that are in the hospital. And then what about like um, in my town, there is no hospitalist. So there's like two competing groups, an independent and then me. And everyone's in the call pool. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm struggling with, I don't necessarily want to be on call for the person who's got 3,000 Medicare patients because if I get one for 10 days while they're on vacation, I have to see that person free for the next 10 days. Mm -hmm. How do you guys manage call? What do you mean you have to see them for free? So it's Dr. X's mm -hmm. patient. I'm opted out. Dr. X is on vacation. I pick them up on a Friday. Dr. X doesn't come back till the following Monday. I have 10 days of inpatient care free of is, charge. Is the hospital seeing them for free? The hospital's charging them, or Medicare, $8,000 a day, uh, you know, uh, whatever, what's it called? What's the word for that? The hospital services? Yeah, the, the non-professional fees. Oh. Facility fees. Mm -hmm. So just tell the hospital to give you, put you on some kind of salary or something. Like, just, you know, you see what I'm saying? Say, well, yeah. I can't get no, paid I, by I Medicare. Don't, I don't think there's a, a great answer to that question. Um, in our town, I'm, I'm not required to be part of the call pool just because we have such low volumes and um, and it's also something where um, there is a hospitalist service that would take over otherwise. Um, so, you know, I, I would say, do you, how many patients are you actually going to be admitting on a regular basis and do you need a call pool? Can you get one person to cover for you for the two weeks that you're on vacation? Um, and go to the hospital from that standpoint and say, hey, I've got in the last year, I've admitted six people from my clinic. Um, maybe I don't need to be on the call pool for the dude with 3,000 patients that has 10 in the hospital at all times. Okay, so we have three good questions, by the way. Congratulations on your practice. Two, uh, two questions uh, specifically requested that I answer. The first is, uh, any facial hair grooming tips? <laughs> None. <laughs> yeah, do as little as possible. Yeah, just, just let, it, let it grow. That's the first one. Okay, the other one is, for me, do you find men are reluctant to allow a Sasquatch to do their vasectomy? <laughs> and the answer is, uh, sometimes. And the, uh, along those lines, as long as we're talking about vasectomies, uh, a funny thing oh, is that all, if, if, when you guys all start this, if you do, uh, all men having a vasectomy are a comedian. Everyone. And the jokes just come, I don't know why, they just, it's, they're nervous, you're next to their, you know, with, you know, a knife. And so it's, let's make jokes about it. And it's always funny. I actually start writing down jokes that patients tell while having a vasectomy. Yeah. I'm going to make a book called Jokes Patients Tell During Their Vasectomy. All right, big hand for both of them.